He is one of the world's most notorious outlaws. He is also a man of sizable wealth and sophistication. Osama bin Laden, born into privilege, chose to lead the life of a fugitive. Over the last decade, the tall, gaunt figure has cast a dark shadow over many parts of the world as the alleged sponsor of acts of terrorism that included the bombing of two U.S. embassies in Africa. He is now said to be sworn to a global holy war, and he seems to have the means to strike at those he considers enemies of Islam in any part of the world. At the beginning of the 20th century, Yemen, on the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, was home to the bin Laden family. The region of Hadramat, where they lived, was steeped in biblical and Quranic history. Hadramat was known as the Manhattan of the desert because of its cluster of ancient skyscrapers made of mud, sand, and grass. Like many in Yemen in the 1930s, Mohammed bin Laden was not a wealthy man. He started out as a laborer in construction. But in the neighboring kingdom of Saudi Arabia, there was opportunity. Soon, millions of dollars would pour in from the oil business, and there would be a boom in building. Mohammed bin Laden was determined to make his fortune there. So he picked up his family and went there and got in uh, on, on the ground floor of that construction boom and eventually developed his business into the bin Laden group a five billion dollar construction industry. Mohammed bin Laden was a devout Sunni Muslim and proved to be a brilliant businessman. He'd won the confidence of King Abdul Aziz with his work on the Saudi royal palaces. He was then rewarded with a contract to renovate the mosque at Mecca. Millions of Muslims have made the pilgrimage to Mecca to worship Allah and visit the birthplace of his prophet Mohammed. Work on the mosque was a great honor for bin Laden. Mecca and Medina are the holiest places in Islam. They hold really tremendous symbolic and religious significance to Muslims. Muhammad bin Laden's work made him rich. He also became the patriarch of a family that would include more than 50 children. There were some 20 sons. In 1957, the family took up residence in the Saudi capital of Riyadh. It was here that Osama bin Laden was born. He was the only son of Muhammad's fourth official wife, a Syrian woman. Having non-Saudi parents set Osama apart in a country where ancestry was of great importance. Still, the family became part of the inner circle of the Saudi court and enjoyed many of the privileges accorded royalty. They were the establishment. They were as much a part of the establishment as one could be not being a member of the royal family. Like many prominent Saudis, the bin Ladens were well-traveled. When going abroad, Osama's mother opted for a chic wardrobe by Chanel rather than traditional Saudi robes. But for all his worldliness and commercial success, Mohammed bin Laden never gave up his commitment to work on places of worship. He said he felt blessed to be awarded the contract for the restoration of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, the most sacred place for Muslims outside of Saudi Arabia. But in 1968, the guiding force of the bin Laden family was gone. Mohammed bin Laden was killed when his helicopter crashed in a desert sandstorm in Saudi Arabia. His family inherited his financial and industrial empire, Osama, one of the heirs to the bin Laden fortune went on to study management and economics at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. He was being um, put into the direction of the family business, construction and renovation, road building. And like other wealthy young Saudis, Osama reportedly took trips to Beirut, Lebanon. In the 1970s, it was a place to have a good time and indulge in vices forbidden in the more conservative Saudi society. There are people who say, and, and people who should know, that he used to take trips to Beirut and go to nightclubs and, and be a drinker and chase women and so on as a teenager. 
But by 1975, Osama was already deeply influenced by the Islamic scholars at his university, like Sheikh Abdullah Azam. They were preaching that the salvation of Saudi youth could only be achieved by a return to the strict values of Islamic teaching. While he was still in school, his family put him to work on a project that kindled a new spiritual fervor in him. He was given a, a renovation job to do on two very holy mosques in Saudi Arabia. And in the process of doing those renovations and running it for the family business, he really, according to these friends, found Islam in a very deep way, in a way he had never found it before as a young man. But religion would also be a source of great upheaval in Osama's life, even as it was igniting passions throughout the region. In 1975, King Faisal was assassinated, and Saudi Arabia was thrown into turmoil over succession and conflicting religious values. The fundamentalists blamed the chaos on the sinful influence of the West. In Iran, in February of 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini led a successful Islamic revolution. He overthrew the Shah and held Americans hostage in Tehran for months. Followers hailed him for his victory over the forces of the West. During the late 1970s, the mosque at Mecca was stormed by Islamic radicals in protest against the Saudi royal family, who were seen as the very symbol of corruption by Muslim fundamentalists. Then on December 26, 1979, an event occurred that shook the Islamic world to its core. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, a Muslim country run by a pro-communist regime. And there was a call for jihad, for Muslims everywhere, to come to the aid of the Muslims in Afghanistan who had been set upon by this evil power. The United States soon entered the Afghan conflict, sending aid, arms, and the CIA. President Jimmy Carter was so offended by the Soviet invasion that he called for a boycott of the 1980 Olympics to be held in Moscow. To me, it's unconscionable for any nation to send athletes to the capital of a nation under the aegis of the Olympics when that nation, that host nation, is actively involved in the invasion of and the subjugation of innocent people. As fate would have it, the war in Afghanistan would find Osama bin Laden on the same side as the United States, fighting against the Soviets. It would not be the last time he would battle to drive an infidel from Muslim soil. Our profile of terrorist Osama bin Laden will continue in a moment. Now save 30%. Call your travel agent or 1-800-BEACHES. Get ready for a revealing profile of The Female Profile. The Wonder Bra was an amazing phenomenon. First we cover and uncover the attribute many women can't seem to live without. A little bit of cleavage can't hurt. Then meet a host of Hef's hotties. People's mouths just drop and what could be better? And find out why being a bunny was the bomb. The whole world opened up to me. It's an evening of facts, fantasies and good clean fun. What's not the like? Curves Ahead, Monday only on the Biography Channel. Welcome to the new millennium. It just got a lot more serious. You're gonna be who you're gonna be. I don't think I'm cut out for this job. This isn't about you. We're on our own. I knew I should have called in sick today. I love you. Third Watch, weeknights at 11 on A&E. It's Freeze Frame on the Biography Channel. This former Miss Hungary had an insatiable appetite for celebrity, vying for the spotlight she starred in Three Ring Circus. She's a glittering showcase of jewels and husbands. 
whose flamboyant style set Hollywood ablaze. The glamorous Hungarian Zsa, Zsa Gabor. Another freeze frame on the Biography Channel. If California sunk into the ocean, will they castle Baywatch? I hope not. No. Who is the mayor of Los Angeles? The mayor of Los Angeles. I'm gonna be one of those dumb people on TV that don't know anything. The Biography Channel, great documentaries. Movies. Movies. Who is a better actor, Madonna or Keanu Reeves? Um, well, <laughs> I'll see you on the road. We now return to our look at Osama bin Laden on Lives of Crime. In 1979, Osama bin Laden had his degree in economics and a bright future in the family's construction business. But he left behind his home and career in Saudi Arabia to take part in a jihad, or holy war. The Soviets had just invaded Afghanistan, and like thousands of young Muslims, Osama bin Laden answered the call to jihad. Bin Laden headed to Peshawar, a border town in Pakistan that was at the center of the Afghan war effort. There he met others from around the Middle East who shared his passion to defend the faith. In many ways, going to Peshawar during the Afghan war was like Woodstock. Uh, it was like Club Med. It was like if you're a self-respecting young Muslim with airfare or somebody willing to buy you a ticket and you don't end up at Peshawar at some point, what's wrong with you? But the conflict in Afghanistan wasn't only about religion. It was also a battleground of the Cold War. Although the CIA did not directly support Osama bin Laden, they were working toward the same goal, the defeat of the Soviets. The Afghans welcomed their help. The Afghans were desperate, so anyone who could come and help them, whether it was with money, or whether it was in person, or, or with any type of other material assistance, was welcome. With his share of his family's fortune, estimated at some $250 million, Bin Laden began to provide humanitarian aid to Afghanis in the form of food and medical care. He set up the service office, uh, first in Peshawar, and, and started to document who was coming in, where they were from, what their next of kin was, what their medical problems might be, um, started to fund ways to, to get people in, to set up the training camps. Osama was uh, one of uh, the key fundraisers. He did a lot of good works. You know, we're talking about... Uh, building orphanages and homes for widows of martyrs of Afghans who died in the war. Bin Laden also commandeered some of the heavy earth-moving equipment owned by his family's company. Of course, the first things he could do were the practical things that he knew, bring uh, bulldozers and money and um, dig a system of trenches uh, for the front lines for fighting. <laughs> Bin Laden even manned the bulldozers himself, a dangerous job since they were often fired on by Soviet helicopters. Some later claimed to have seen him working right through the bombardments. Bin Laden became a hero to the Afghans, not just a financier. Though he still had a taste for custom-made English boots, he lived, ate, and fought with the Mujahideen and wore their native dress. All he had to really do was provide the money. He didn't have to physically place himself in danger. He didn't have to physically go into Afghanistan and share the life, the privations, the hardships of the Mujahideen themselves. But he did it. Bin Laden helped to recruit Muslims from all over the world to help drive the Russians, avowed atheists, out of Afghanistan. He brought volunteers in at his own expense and trained them in a camp he set up. But Afghans at the same time were naive. Uh, and thinking that uh, these foreign elements who used to come to Afghanistan were going to leave once the struggle was over. And the problem was that they didn't leave. Bin Laden worked closely during the war with Sheikh Abdullah Azam, his former college professor and spiritual advisor. 
Azam, a religious fundamentalist, was dedicated to liberating Islamic lands from foreigners. Osama bin Laden would incorporate some of Azam's teachings into his own more radical version of global jihad. Azam played a critical part in influencing not just Osama bin Laden, many of the activists and many of the rank and file of the Islamist movement who really participated in the war in Afghanistan, and in fact beyond Afghanistan as well. Ironically, the Afghan war gave radical Islamists the chance to learn the art of war and to make connections with others who shared their views. But Osama bin Laden's wider agenda was not necessarily shared by the Afghan people. He presented a new type of Islamic zeal in Islamic um, ideological, revolutionary uh, type of mentality. The Afghans thought, well, we are fighting for our religion in our country, for our freedom, basically. And these foreign elements, including Osama bin Laden, had a different agenda. Their agenda was that they are fighting um, in defense of the Islamic world against an atheist country. By the mid-1980s, the war was not going well for the Afghans and their allies. It looked like their ragtag army would be crushed by the Soviets' powerful military arsenal. We went through vicious battles with the Russians. They used poisonous gas against us. I was subjected to this. They used airplanes against our position. We lost many fighters, but we were able to deter many commando attacks, unlike anything before. In 1986, the United States sent Stinger missiles to ward off Russian bombers and helicopters. They helped the Afghans turn the tide of a war that went on for three more years. By 1988, Osama had a large database of Mujahideen and other supporters. Al-Qaeda, or the base as it became known, was an international directory of militants he would call on in the future. His organization, Al-Qaeda, the base, is actually a database. It's a database of the names of the Arabs who fought in Afghanistan, which he then made into a kind of a network. <laughs> The war in Afghanistan lasted for 10 years. Finally, in 1989, the Russians pulled out. It signaled the weakening of the Soviet Union, and it was later seen as the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Afghanistan became Russia's Vietnam. They finally turned tail and left. Now, here's Osama bin Laden, who has just been a point man, a, a key general and funder in the jihad that turned one of the two superpowers at that time in the world on its tail and running. There was one last major battle in the town of Jalalabad, aimed at ridding the country of the communist government. The communist had the big artillery, and the Mujahideen took heavy losses. Osama was on the front lines and still carries the Russian-made Kalishnikov, he says, he took from a dead Soviet general. Later, bin Laden would compare himself to the 12th century warrior Saladin, who drove the Crusaders from the Holy Land. But not everyone remembers Osama bin Laden as a war hero. I think that Osama was probably in a couple of pretty desperate fights. But beyond that, there wasn't much that one could point to as a, as a major combat uh, role for any of the Arabs. The Battle of Jalalabad marked the end of a decade of fighting. The Afghans reclaimed their country, but at a terrible price. Then, in November of 1989, Sheikh Hazam was assassinated in a car bomb attack. Now, with his spiritual leader dead and the Russians gone, bin Laden finally returned home to Saudi Arabia at the age of 32. And he's quite a hero. And he's a hero to his family. He's a hero to Mujahideen uh, from all over the Islamic world. And he's a, he's a homecoming hero to the Saudis. And in the House of Saud, uh, the Saudi royal family, um, he, is, he is regarded very highly. Bin Laden tried to return to his old life, working for the family construction company. But soon his extremist views brought him into conflict with the royal family, with whom he had once shared close ties. The hostility came to a head on August 2nd, 1990. 
when Iraq invaded Saudi Arabia's neighbor, Kuwait. The Saudis feared they would be next. Bin Laden understood the threat that this posed to his homeland, but when the Saudi government turned to the United States for military assistance, he fiercely protested the decision. In his eyes, it was making a pact with the infidel. Bin Laden's theory is that all of the Arabian Peninsula, and Arabia in particular, Saudi Arabia, is the holiest of holy lands, and that no non-Muslim should set foot there, and certainly not um, for the protection of American interests, which he considers evil. He claimed America was only concerned with safeguarding its interest in Arabian oil. He warned that once American troops were in Saudi Arabia, they would never leave. He worried that the United States would use the Arabian Peninsula as a staging area to protect Israel, the enemy to much of the Arab world. And he bristled at a non-Muslim power attacking another Muslim country, Iraq. Osama bin Laden wielded great influence with the public because of his role in the Afghan war. And the Saudi government started putting pressure on him to stop his criticism. They threatened to retaliate against his family and bankrupt the bin Laden company. Osama bin Laden was placed under house arrest for a time in Jeddah. They begin to view him as a threat because he's criticizing the government for its arrangements with the West. Uh, he's warned to leave. Uh, he's told that his life is in danger, and he leaves. In April of 1991, 34-year-old Osama bin Laden fled to Afghanistan and then moved on to the Sudan, where a militantly Islamic government had taken power. It was here that Osama bin Laden became one of the most powerful and radical voices in the Islamic world. Our profile of terrorist Osama bin Laden will continue in a moment. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Available for the first time, the Red Skelton Estate has released the greatest and funniest moments of Red's years on NBC. For over 50 years, Red Skelton entertained and delighted audiences unlike any other comedian. Not seen for over 30 years, we now offer this special authorized three-hour set of America's favorite clown, Red Skelton in living color, the NBC years. Bring back the delightful memories of Plum Cadiddlehopper. Careful, there's hair under there, buddy. Freddy the Freeloader, San Fernando Red, and Sheriff Deadeye. I mean, why do you wear your watch out all the time? I didn't have it out. No ass. Featuring a galaxy of your favorite stars. Now look! <laughs> After I got out of the war, there was nothing to do. You in war? What, 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 what'd you do in the army? <laughs> well, my dreams have come true, and that was to work with the clown mastery of the master. Call now. Hello, operator. Three hilarious hours of true family entertainment. You bet it is. Wild, spontaneous, and unpredictable hilarity. Even with the big coat on, I know that's her. <laughs> With all the live flubs and bloopers included. Hey, they ain't $200 bucks worth. <laughs> Order this never before available three hour collection Red Skelton in Living Color, the NBC Years. Call within the next 30 minutes, and the Red Skelton family will add a very special gift free the Red Skelton Christmas Special in Glorious Color. A total of four full hours of the best of Red Skelton will be in your home for two easy payments of $19.99. Ask about the limited edition collector's lithograph of Rat. That's four full hours in living color, only available through this exclusive TV offer. Call now and receive the special Christmas bonus tape. And may God bless. Good night. Thank you. Call the number on your screen now and have Red Skelton back in your home. Ask how to receive rush delivery. Credit card, check, or money order. Call now. Jordan Cavanaugh just picked up a second job. If you want to play cops and robbers, do it on your own time. Freeze. On A&E Saturdays. Self-assured and sexier than ever, Jill Hennessy is sensational, and you can quote us on that. Crossing Jordan at a new time and place. Saturdays at 9 on A&E. 
Get ready for a revealing profile of the female profile. The Wonder Bra was an amazing phenomenon. First, we cover and uncover the attribute many women can't seem to live without. A little bit of cleavage can't hurt. Then meet a host of Hef's hotties. People's mouths just drop and what could be better? And find out why being a bunny was the bomb. The whole world opened up to me. It's an evening of facts, fantasies, and good clean fun. What's not the like? Curves Ahead, Monday only on the Biography Channel. Forces within you. Force yourself. Find your inspiration. Biography Magazine. In February, a candid conversation with actor Kevin Spacey. BB Newworth Uncovered. And Biography Honors Black History Month with our salute to black entertainers. Pick up February's Biography Magazine on newsstands now. For whoever you are, find your inspiration in Biography Magazine. Every life has a story. We now return to our look at Osama bin Laden on Lives of Crime. By 1991, 34-year-old Osama bin Laden had become persona non grata in his home country of Saudi Arabia. He'd been an outspoken critic of the government in Riyadh during the Gulf War and predicted that if American troops came to the Saudi Peninsula, they would never leave. And history has shown no matter what you think about anything else, that bin Laden's prediction was essentially accurate. American troops didn't leave Saudi Arabia at the end of the war, but bin Laden soon did. He fled across the Red Sea to the Sudan, where a militant Islamic revolution had recently taken place. In fact, Osama bin Laden was just one of many refugee Muslims seeking safe haven in Sudan. The new government wanted to create a homeland for Muslims from around the world so any Muslim could enter without a visa. Hundreds of Mujahideen as well as many suspected terrorists flooded into the country. It would be the perfect place for bin Laden to widen his network and pursue his political agenda. He got money, which is enough for him to finance his own people. And he got the ideology to recruit many desperate, frustrated Muslim young chaps. Bin Laden invested heavily in the Sudan, establishing several legitimate businesses, including a major construction company. It was a mutually beneficial relationship. The Sudanese uh, government was and is very poor. Osama's money... Uh, his construction projects, his investments, all made him very, very welcome in the country. And clearly, there was that tie that bound them. Bin Laden's private life seemed uneventful. He worshipped at the local mosque and lived comfortably in a large home in a quiet neighborhood. By this time, he had several wives and many children. A very good Muslim, a very good man, an Arab man. He's living with his uh, brothers and his uh, community here, like uh, Saudi Arabia, and he's not a terrorist or uh, something like that. But bin Laden was also reportedly busy expanding the activities of al-Qaeda, his alleged network of militants who advocated global jihad. He uh, wanted to use uh, Sudan as a launching point to send basically jihadists to the secular Arab world, train them to deploy them and to overthrow the secular regimes and basically establish uh, Islamic governments in those countries. That was his goal. Still, the United States was only distantly aware of him. By 1991, 1992, uh, bin Laden comes on to the U.S. radar scope as someone out there. Not as a major menace, but as someone out there who has uh, done things which are uh, uh, of concern to the United States. It wouldn't be long before the United States became bin Laden's primary target. In 1992, U.S. troops were sent to Somalia to assist in U.N. famine relief efforts. Bin Laden did not see this as a humanitarian gesture. For him, the presence of American soldiers in a Muslim country was a violation. On October 3, 1993, U.S. Special Forces in Somalia were caught in a bloody encounter with local guerrillas in Mogadishu. When their Black Hawk helicopters were shot down, the bodies of U.S. soldiers were dragged through the streets. 
18 Americans and several hundred Somalis were killed. Years later, bin Laden told Bari Atwan from the Arabic newspaper Al-Quds Al-Arabi that he'd planned the attack. He said, we knew the American will come to Somalia. We sent our people there to wait for them a month ahead. And when they came, we attacked them. Evidence tying bin Laden to these attacks is inconclusive, but American troops were forced to withdraw from Somalia. It was a defeat that would haunt the Clinton administration. By the mid-1990s, bin Laden's jihad movement was gaining momentum, and his name was frequently associated with terrorist activities. In 1994, the Saudi government revoked bin Laden's citizenship and moved to freeze his assets. His family then disavowed him. Hey, Chief, where you going? Let's go. In February of 1993, there was a terrorist attack that would bring bin Laden and his network to the attention of U.S. law enforcement. New York's World Trade Center was bombed. The explosion killed six and wounded more than 1,000. Although there was no immediate evidence tying bin Laden to the blast, his name later surfaced in connection to Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind of the attack. In February of 1995, Youssef was captured in Pakistan. Intelligence officials at the time, including FBI investigators, saw some intriguing links between uh, Ramzi Youssef and bin Laden. Uh, one of bin Laden's guest houses, the address was found in Ramzi Youssef's pocket. Western law enforcement began to realize bin Laden was a new kind of foe, a stateless sponsor of terrorism who used his fortune to support extremist causes. He's not a sovereign nation. He doesn't have to worry about being condemned in the United Nations. He doesn't need those kind of allies. He is a man unto himself, um, driven with a certain cause, and the money to back that up. Makes him uh, a powerful adversary. And bin Laden proved relentless in pursuing his main objective, getting American troops out of the Saudi Peninsula. He is challenging the mighty American, and he is not afraid of them. While the Muslim governments are seeking the American blessing, this man is challenging this American uh, mighty superpower. In August 1995, bin Laden wrote to Saudi King Fahd calling for guerrilla warfare on the American forces stationed in Saudi Arabia. That November, five Americans and two Indians were killed in the bombing of a National Guard truck in Riyadh. In May of 1996, four Saudi men accused in the attack were beheaded in Riyadh's main square. They admitted to being inspired by bin Laden, but some later claimed this confession had been coerced. Bin Laden later denied involvement but praise the act. If you ask Osama bin Laden, were you behind this? He never says yes. It's very important to him to say, this is jihad, this is holy war, this is Islam against the infidels, against America, against the West. And to do that, he can't be the centerpiece. American officials now began pressing Sudan to eject bin Laden. According to U.S. intelligence, he was financing terrorist training camps in northern Sudan as well as in northern Yemen. The Saudis were also lobbying to have him thrown out of his Sudanese base. And by 1996, Sudanese said, okay, uh, we'll get rid of him. You want us to send him back to you? And they said, no, thank you. Bin Laden finally chose to return to Afghanistan, one of the world's poorest countries. It was still an unstable land torn by warring factions and with no diplomatic relationship with the United States. Now, he could not be brought to justice in the West. So, in hindsight, it might have been better if he were in the Sudan where we could have gotten at him more easily. And I don't think we uh, understood in any really uh, comprehensive fashion what kind of a danger he could become in a, in a country which is basically no man's land. Osama bin Laden would soon be known as the most dangerous man in the world. Our profile of terrorist Osama bin Laden will continue in a moment. Do you have trouble reading labels, cash register receipts, menus, and more because of small print, low light, or both? 
then you need the amazing All Optical Wallet Light. The world's first high-tech magnifying light that's so small, it fits in your wallet's credit card holder. So it's always with you when you need it. No more clumsy reading glasses. Use the Owl's powerful magnifying light to read menus, meal checks, credit card slips, product labels, cash register receipts, plus roadmaps, phone books, and more. I was always forgetting my reading glasses. Now the Owl is in my wallet all the time. I always use the Owl in a restaurant. It's so convenient. The best thing about the Owl is no more embarrassing jokes about not being able to see. Use the Owl anytime, anywhere you need instant light or magnification. Great for finding keyholes in the dark and providing light in emergencies. Everyone should carry the Owl for the light. The Owl is not sold in stores. Order right now through this special TV offer for just $19.95 and we'll give you a second Owl free. Call 1-800-426-0576. You're such a star. Move away. Move away. No. Yes. No. Every Friday. A little bit to the left. Take it off. No, no, no. Put it on. Feel like a star. I will move your hair. You love yourself? Oh, yes. Meet the people who make the people. I'm shooting in a circle. I will give you the star treatment. The star treatment. Fridays only on the Biography Channel. Within every city lurks a scandalous tale, a tale surrounded by quirky characters, dirty family secrets, and lurid motives. Nobody trusted the cruelest anybody. person. One you. of those things never believed. That poison would and lethal. Tucked away in cities that hide the truth and house the depraved, you'll find tales that can only be told in City Confidential. I'm Paul Winfield. Join me for City Confidential Wednesday nights at 10 on AME. Every family has a story. To discover yours, visit genealogy.com. At genealogy.com, you can find ancestors, build a family tree, and learn more about your family's unique story. <laughs> hey, guys, look at this. It says here your great-great-uncles were the Wright brothers. Who? Yeah. The Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur. Take a look. Log on to genealogy.com. Your family story is waiting. Hi there, I'm Biography Bruce in Savannah. Welcome to Shrimp Country. We're going to play a game now. It's called the Forrest Gump Game. Shrimp Creole. Popcorn shrimp. Baked shrimp, steamed shrimp. Shrimp sundaes. Shrimp on a rock. Hot shrimp. Bull shrimp. When did this accident happen to you? The Biography Channel, specials, documentaries, and movies. Barbecue shrimp. Wiggling shrimp. Popcorn shrimp. Spiders and shrimp. <laughs> lots and lots of shrimp. That's all you can make with shrimp, I think. Today we're going to see how a customer order turns into their perfect PC. All the orders come in here. Don't forget the website. I mean, all the orders come in either here or the website. I put it all together. Big old hard drive, extra memory for performance, CD burner. Don't touch that. Every machine's a custom job. They call you the customizer? No, they don't. After testing, I pack it up and ship it out. An award-winning 24-7 service and support goes with it. Happy trails, little buddy. Hope S. Jackson gives you a good home. Get America's favorite PC, like this Dimension Desktop for just $5.99 after a $100 mail-in rebate, featuring an Intel Pentium 4 processor for awesome performance for today's digital entertainment, recording music, sharing photos, gaming, and beyond. And for a limited time, you'll get a free CD burner. Get great deals on notebooks, too. Dude, we're getting another Dell. Sweet. When you want your perfect PC, it's easy as Dell. Dell PCs use Intel Pentium 4 processors. We now return to our look at Osama bin Laden on Lives of Crime. In May of 1996, the government of the Sudan expelled Osama bin Laden under pressure from the United States and Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden returned to Afghanistan, where he helped the fundamentalist Islamic group, the Taliban, in their attempt to control the country. They would soon be joining him in making Afghanistan the home base for his vision of global jihad. Non-Taliban veterans of the Afghan war were also still loyal to bin Laden and now rallied around him. The same network that supported and helped bin Laden back in the 1980s and the network that bin Laden was part of in Pakistan and in Afghanistan were still very much uh, active. 
In the spring of 1996, President Clinton signed a top secret order to shut down bin Laden's network. But even though bin Laden may have been more figurehead than godfather, he was becoming the face of terrorism and would remain the prime suspect when any terrorist act was reported. This appeared to be the case when on the morning of June 25, 1996, a truck drove into Kobar Towers, the U.S. military residence in Dahran. The truck blew up, killing 19 American servicemen. Bin Laden was the chief suspect, but he took his usual position. He told me that he supported al Khobar attacks, but he refused to admit uh, on the record that he was behind it. He was extremely sympathetic to, toward any attacks against the Americans. Uh, the man hates the American policies in the region. Information later surfaced that the actual evidence in the bombing pointed not to bin Laden, but to a Shiite Muslim group. But his threat of violence escalated dramatically in 1998 when bin Laden called for a jihad against the Jews and others he called crusaders. He said Americans, including civilians, should be killed by Muslims anywhere in the world. His order was delivered as a fatwa, or religious ruling. He uses the practice of fatwa in order to serve his political ideology and to legitimize, uh, I mean, his own uh, goal and his own front. In May of 1998, ABC News correspondent John Miller went to Afghanistan to conduct an interview with bin Laden. Bin Laden's appearance was cause for celebration for his men. All hell breaks loose. Missiles are shot up in the air, tracer bullets, and men love to see him. When he walks into the room and you realize this guy is 6'3 or 6'4, um, he never raises his voice. Um, he doesn't pound the table or use his fist. He's not a fiery orator. He's soft-spoken. But the words, the words he was using, uh, were extremely powerful and frightening. He had three principal issues. One was to remove the U.S. military presence from Saudi Arabia. The other was to end the U.S. support of Israel, uh, particularly as it affected negatively the Palestinians. And three was, at that time, an immediate halt to the bombing of Iraq, and even still now today, uh, an end to sanctions that he felt um, adversely affected Iraqi women and children and, and, and innocents. Miller questioned bin Laden about the disturbing fatwa targeting American civilians. Bin Laden fired back. American history does not distinguish between civilians and military, not even women and children. They're the ones who used the bombs against Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The fatwa applies to all those who assist and support in killing the sons of Muslims. In June of 1998, a grand jury in New York issued a sealed indictment of Osama bin Laden on a charge of conspiracy to attack defense facilities of the United States. He was further charged with being a major financier of Islamic terrorists around the world. What he has done is gone from being the leader of a small band of very dedicated soldiers who could fight a war for him, maybe, uh, against the Russians, against um, the opposition forces in Afghanistan, to being the leader of a terrorist conglomerate. It's essentially like the Ford Foundation for terrorists. This investment in terrorism had terrible consequences. On August 7, 1998, the eighth anniversary of the arrival of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia, there were massive explosions at the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. Authorities were stunned by the magnitude of the assault, found to be the work of members of Al-Qaeda, bin Laden's network. They're a heck of a lot more organized and disciplined than a lot of people would give them credit for. I think you have to have uh, an infrastructure in place for some time. There's a lot of planning, and those were, were planned for a long time. The devastation was enormous in Nairobi. 213 people, including 12 Americans, died and 4,500 people were wounded. The bomb in Dar es Salaam killed 11 and injured 85. John Miller contacted bin Laden, 
confronting him on the logic of this attack. The result of the bombing was that so many Africans, innocent women, children, Muslims, were killed in that attack. And his answer was essentially that in jihad, whoever dies, it is the will of Allah, that that was their destiny. But many others of the Muslim faith disagree with bin Laden. Many Muslims I've spoken to felt outraged by uh, what happened uh, in Africa. Muslims and Muslim Islamic practices do not sanction or condone indiscriminate killings of civilians, regardless of the conditions. So in this particular sense, Osama bin Laden, he, his argument and his fatwa outside the mainstream practices and uh, interpretation of Islam and, and uh, Muslims' practices. After the bombings in Africa, Osama bin Laden was public enemy number one. In August of 1998, a group of advisors informed President Clinton that they had reason to believe bin Laden was planning to acquire chemical and biological weapons to use against U.S. installations. The White House was looking to retaliate. The United States launched an attack this morning on one of the most active terrorist bases in the world. It is located in Afghanistan and operated by groups affiliated with Osama bin Laden. The U.S. launched millions of dollars worth of cruise missiles against bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. But the attack was of little use. Bin Laden and some of his men had already left the campsites. After the strike on Afghanistan and Sudan, people said bin Laden is a hero. He was able to drive America crazy to shoot here and there, then he must be a hero. The president also gave the order to bomb a pharmaceutical company in the Sudan, believed to be financed by bin Laden. The factory was destroyed, but a subsequent investigation never found proof that it produced anything illegal. The plant had no connection to bin Laden at the time of the strike. Embarrassed and frustrated, the U.S. government also failed in trying to completely close off bin Laden's financial pipelines. Uh, as soon as we, we uh, identify one financial conduit, another one springs up. It's the uh, fortune and support of other like-minded, wealthy people uh, in the Gulf that, that keep him going. And some, uh, some support uh, clandestinely through his family that continues to come to him. In November of 1998, the United States brought indictments against bin Laden and other suspected terrorists with numerous charges including the bombing of the U.S. embassies in Africa and other acts of terrorism against Americans abroad. The U.S. now offered a $5 million reward for any information leading to bin Laden's arrest, but that would prove a very tough reward to collect. Our profile of terrorist Osama bin Laden will continue in a moment. It's only a little scratch. Here is scratch, there is scratch, everywhere a scratch, scratch. And they're all an eyesore. What you need is GS27 Scratch Remover. It gets rid of those surface scratches quickly and easily. Simply rub GS27 into the scratch, then polish to a beautiful finish. The scratch is gone. Would you do this to a brand new car? Ouch! But GS27 removes that ugly scratch quickly and easily. It'll even remove paint scrapes and unsightly rust. GS27 is only $9.95. But call right now and get a second tube for only $5. That's two for just $14.95. Plus, we'll give you this key finder key ring free. Just whistle and the key ring beeps. Order your GS27 now. Call 1-800-426-6140 to order GS27 Scratch Remover now. Get one tube for $9.95 or double your order and receive two tubes for just $14.95. Call 1-800-426-6140. Welcome to the new millennium. It just got a lot more serious. You're gonna be who you're gonna be. I don't think I'm cut out for this job. This isn't about you. We're on our own. Maybe we should have called in sick today. I love you. Third Watch, weeknights at 11 on A&E. If you lived before our time, who would you be? What if you could choose from a thousand yesterdays? 
when the past was today and the new took your breath away. Who would you be? How would you live? Who would you love? Living every generation before us, remembering for generations to come. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. They're the people you thought you knew, and the people you want to know more about. The all-new Biography Channel. Step out of your life and into the lives of movie stars and moguls. From their most dramatic on-screen performances to the untold drama of their lives. Every night, you could live another life. Movies, biographies, and documentaries. 24 hours a day. The Biography Channel. Triple H, go, pin him, give him the pedigree, you. Here's Hollywood's beauty queen. Oh, hello, it's Liz here, and I'm... Oh, sugar, what's wrong? Perhaps a calf's liver treat will appease you. Too slow. <laughs> sugar. No! Short shorts, only on the Biography Channel. We now return to our look at Osama bin Laden on Lives of Crime. In his early 40s, Osama bin Laden remained in hiding in Afghanistan, protected by the Taliban, fundamentalist Muslims who'd taken over the country. He continued to live as a fugitive, but the primitive conditions of his lifestyle brought him even closer to his followers. I think he does it as part of an inspiration that I have left behind my life of wealth and money that I use that money to further this, jihad, what we do, um, not to make Osama bin Laden more comfortable, that I won't live any better than any of you who are engaged in the fight with me. Osama bin Laden may have been a man on the run, but he was also now a public figure. Surviving the U.S. bombing raid made him an icon to some in the Muslim world. Almost nobody in Afghanistan ever heard of Osama bin Laden. Almost no one throughout the Muslim world had heard of Osama bin Laden. Now, everyone has heard of Osama bin Laden. Osama has become a major symbol. For instance, in the areas of Pakistan next to Afghanistan, Osama has become the most popular name for baby boys. The beginning of the year 2000 brought bright hopes for the world in a new century, but it also brought more threats of terrorism. In the wake of the missile attacks on his camps in Afghanistan in 1998, bin Laden had delivered a chilling message. He said, we want to pass a message to President Clinton that the war has not yet started, and we will answer this raid with deeds, with action, not with words. It seemed that answer may have been delivered on October 12, 2000. The USS Cole, a state-of-the-art, billion-dollar warship, was refueling in the port of Aden in Yemen. Two men in a small craft pulled alongside in a suicide bombing attack. A huge hole was blown in the side of the ship, killing 17 U.S. naval personnel and injuring many more. The two bombers were blown to bits, but suspicion was already pointing to someone nowhere near the blast. Well, you don't always have the, the, the evidence that would satisfy a jury that Osama bin Laden pressed the button to make it happen. What you do have in all of these major incidents is either direct involvement by bin Laden and his people, or much more often, traces of bin Laden, of bin Laden's money, of bin Laden's training, of bin Laden's inspiration. Later, reports from Yemeni officials said that five suspects in the coal attack admitted to being trained in bin Laden's camps. There are now many Muslims who have turned their back on bin Laden as a result of his activities. In many countries, there has been a crackdown on militants, and Afghanistan has suffered painful sanctions for harboring bin Laden. I believe that the basic feeling of uh, most Afghans about Osama bin Laden, his Arab friends, the Taliban, and the groups that are fighting against the Taliban, is that they wish they would all just disappear, go away, and leave them alone. As for Osama himself, he's planned for the worst. He's already appointed his successor, if anything should happen to him, an Egyptian known as Mohammed Atef. There is a $5 million reward from the U.S. for information about him as well. 
The two men also share family ties. In January of 2001, Osama's son married Atef's daughter in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Bin Laden read a poem for the occasion. The wounds of Jerusalem are still fresh at my side, as a fire is still burning within. I did not betray God's covenant like other countries did. In spite of these moments that seem almost surreal in their civility, for many, Osama bin Laden remains a larger-than-life figure, as threatening as he is mysterious. Uh, so we do have uh, the habit of demonizing one person, having one person encapsulate all our fears and, and concerns. But is he overestimated? Well, in sense of national security, perhaps he is. He's more like a, a fly buzzing around the ear of an elephant. But has he killed innocent people? Yes. On May 29th of 2001, four men were convicted in New York for their role in the 1998 U.S. Embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. But Osama bin Laden, the man prosecutors say ordered the bombings, continues to find ways to elude those dedicated to his capture. He is the one now who's causing the American taxpayer $2 billion to enhance the safety of the American embassies all over the world. This is the work of a clever man, not a work of a stupid man. I think he believes that what he's doing is God's work. I think he intends to die for it. I think bin Laden uh, believes that he will be a martyr and that, uh, that if this costs him uh, his life, that that is his destiny uh, for Allah. Here's a pop quiz to raise your credit IQ. You cut up your credit card on your 26th birthday, owing $3,000 at an APR of 20%, you pay the 2% minimums every month. You're never late. How much will it cost you to pay off your $3,000 debt? $16,000, and you'll be 80 years old. Paying minimums, it's a maximum problem. We're the National Consumer Council, raising our voice for a debt-free America. The force is within you. Force yourself. Find your inspiration. Biography Magazine. In February, a candid conversation with actor Kevin Spacey, B.B. Newirth Uncovered, and Biography Honors Black History Month with our salute to black entertainers. Pick up February's Biography Magazine on newsstands now. For whoever you are, find your inspiration in Biography Magazine. Every life has a story. Looking for the very best in quality entertainment? You're just a click away. Shop AETV.com. Celebrate Valentine's Day with the passion and splendor of A&E's Romance Classics Collection, featuring eight of our extraordinary literary adaptations. Plus, order by February 19th and save $50 off the regular price. Log on to the official website of A&E Television Networks. When it comes to quality, why settle for anything less? Shop AETV.com. Would you like to own your own business and enjoy financial independence? Nationwide Cyber Systems introduces the most exciting business opportunity of the 21st century, public access internet terminals. These amazing machines offer high-speed internet access, email, and video email to the public for only 25 cents per minute. They take cash and credit cards. Bill Gates says in any area where there's payphones, you'll start to find public internet terminals. Forecasters predict that 300,000 of these machines will be in service throughout the U.S. by 2005. How many would you like to own? Nationwide can start you in a turnkey business and help you secure the most profitable locations in your area before someone else gets them. You can start part-time and expand according to your own timetable. Call now for your free video and information package. There is unlimited income potential. Don't delay. The best locations won't last long.
intrigue and betrayal.